the book of Esther and the seventh chapter. We're going to read the entire chapter. We're going to be thinking about Haman's end, the end of wicked Haman. And so it begins this way, chapter 7, verse 1. So the king and Haman came to banquet with Esther the queen. And the king said again unto Esther on the second day at the banquet of wine, What is thy petition, Queen Esther? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? And it shall be performed even to the half of the kingdom. Then Esther the queen answered and said, If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. But if we had been sold for bondmen or bondwomen, I had held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. Then the king Ahasuerus answered and said unto Esther, the queen, Who is he, and where is he, that durst presume in his heart to do so? And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. And the king, arising from the banquet of wine, in his wrath went into the palace garden, and Haman stood up to make request for his life to Esther the queen, for he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. Then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place of the banquet of wine, and Haman was fallen upon the bed whereon Esther was. Then said the king, Will he force the queen also before me in the house? As the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. And Harbona, one of the chamberlains, said before the king, Behold also the gallows, fifty cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, who had spoken good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. Then the king said, Hang him thereon. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. So as we said, we're going to title this Haman's End, and it certainly includes his last supper before his end. And it wasn't, as we might say, a happy meal for him. Uh, it was a very uh, solemn occasion. Interesting that God had warned this man, Haman, uh, through various circumstances, uh, obviously, the previous day, having to lead his adversary, Mordecai, through the whole uh, uh, citadel uh, and uh, the city square uh, ought to have been a, a warning to him. And then on top of that, both his advisors and friends and his wife also had given warning to this man that uh, if the Jews, somehow there was something supernatural about these people and, and uh, you need to be uh, exercise some care. And so he had had, sadly, he had been given warnings, but he had not heeded the warnings. And we're reminded from the book of Proverbs, and I'm just take the time to read it, Proverbs 16, verse 5, he says, uh, the, the, the writer of the Proverbs says this, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Now, let me just pause there before I read the rest of the verse, because you know, we often will cite things like homosexuality is an abomination to the Lord. <laughs> but let me tell you something. Pride is an abomination to the Lord. God abominates it. He, 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 it's a strong emotion. He absolutely hates pride just as he hates uh, the uh, degrading sin of homosexuality. So it says, Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord, though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. In other words, God is saying, somebody consistently persists in pride, there will be consequences, and that will result ultimately in divine punishment. He will not go unpunished. Well, in chapter 6, 
the Agagite, uh, Haman, had begun to fall. His wife uh, had made sure that he understood that. Uh, and if you well, maybe we'll just read verse 13 of chapter 6 just to remind us. And so it says, And Haman told Zeresh his wife and all his friends everything that had befallen him. Then said his wise men, so here's his advisors, and Zeresh his wife unto him, If Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews before whom thou hast begun to fall, thou shalt not prevail against him, but shall surely fall before him. So he had begun to fall in chapter 6, and in chapter 7, we're going to see his fall completed. Don't we sense, though, that in Haman, uh, we said pride is the most satanic of sins. Remember, he, uh, the, the enemy, Satan, said, I will be like the Most High. And it's just good to remind ourselves that, that our adversary has already begun to fall. Uh, the enemy of our souls. He's already begun to fall. And uh, we're going to see his ultimate end. Uh, he, he's, he's going to be completed. And I just want to just take a moment to look at the book of Revelation, just to remind ourselves of, because we're going to see in this man, uh, uh, Haman, definitely a type of Satan, foreshadowing, if you like, of the fall of Satan, because he's got all of Satan's characteristics. Uh, the way Esther's going to describe the enemy is the very language that's used of, of Satan himself. He's he prideful, all the rest of it. So Revelation 12, in verse 9, um, it says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And so, again, the, he's begun to fall. That's the idea. Chapter 12, verse 13, when the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Well, isn't that what Haman has been trying to do? Uh, contextually, we're going to see Revelation 12, the woman is Israel. And so the same anti-Semitic fury that is seen in Satan, especially in the last days, was also seen here uh, in uh, the passage in uh, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 13. And then when we get to Revelation chapter 20, we see the continuing fall of this enemy. It says, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years, cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And of course, we know that his ultimate end is that he will be thrown into the lake of fire forever and ever. And so just as Haman, uh, this proud, arrogant, uh, if you like, satanic interpreter, uh, 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 Im impersonator, uh, we're going to see that the one who in, he's impersonating will also share a similar fate. Now, I want to give you a kind of a, an outline of the chapter uh, just briefly. Now, verse 1 and 2, we've got the cordiality of Ahasuerus. Uh, again, how willing he is to give Esther everything that she's asked. So he's very cordial towards her. Uh, verse 3 and 4, we're going to see the concern of Esther. Uh, why has she risked her life? What's behind this? And so we're going to see the cordiality of, uh, of Ahasuerus, the concern of Esther. Verses 5 and 6, we're going to get a description of the character of the enemy. And we're going to find out all about his ways. What is, what is Haman like? Who is he? <laughs> what is he like? Uh, verse 7 and 8, the condemnation of Haman. And then finally, verses 9 and 10, the counsel of Harbona. He's going to give some advice about what to do with this rascal to the king. And so here we launch into this passage. And so it begins with this idea of the king and Haman came to banquet with Esther, the queen, one of the many banquets in this book. And the king said again to Esther, showing again his uh, willingness uh, to uh, give her what she requires. He said again to Esther on the second day at the banquet of wine, what is thy petition, Queen Esther, 
and it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? It shall be performed even to half of the kingdom. So the king is once again willing to deal generously with the queen and her request, uh, giving her what she asked for. Perhaps, again, maybe his conscience is bothering him uh, that this uh, he has neglected this beautiful woman, uh, his wife, for 30 days. Maybe that's part of it. But I, I also suspect that there's, a, there's a, some growing impatience here uh, upon him in that uh, he's been, she's risked her life to, to, to ask for a banquet. And he realizes there's more to it than just wanting to have a meal with him and him and two days in a row. He, he recognizes that there's, there's a story behind the story and his impatience, he, he's anxious to know what is the real reason behind the banquets. So again, we just see something of his generosity, willing to give even to half his kingdom, he says. And again, we said that's hyper, hyperbole. It's just uh, uh, that's very typical of uh, Eastern monarchs. But but he is in a place where he wants to be very generous. It's good to remind ourselves that, again, we've used this application before, but we're coming to a king who is more than willing to act benevolently towards us he told us again and again ask uh, ask him uh, seek him knock uh, he'll give it to us uh, he he's not gonna if we, he, if we come and we ask for bread he's not going to give us a stone i mean we've got so many encouragements uh, john newton the great hymn writer uh, he used words like this he says thou art coming to a king large petitions with thee bring for his grace and power are such None can ever ask too much. Are we coming with that consciousness of who we're coming to, his great willingness that he's benevolent and he's willing to give us what we ask, and he's very capable of answering our requests. His grace and power is such, none can ever ask too much. So now the moment has come for Esther to express her concern the concern of esther then esther the queen answered and said now i want you to notice again she doesn't forget her courtly manners this man is her husband but he's also her sovereign and so she says esther the queen answered and said if i have found favor in thy sight o king and if it please the king let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. So she doesn't presume on the goodwill of King Ahasuerus. Uh, she doesn't forget that he is indeed the sovereign and the monarch. And so she addresses him with the utmost reverence and awe. Unlike ha Haman, if you remember in chapter six, uh, when the king had asked him uh, what should be done to the, the man the king delights to honor, uh, we see in chapter 6, verse 7, Haman answered the king, for the man whom the king delights to honor, he forgets all the courtly protocol because he's thinking of, he's obsessed with himself. He's sure it's him that's going to be the man that the king delights to honor. And so he runs straight away into his shopping list of what that man would want. And he forgets his courtly manners. But certainly Esther came with reverence. And again, we need to recognize as benevolent as our king is he's still the lord of lords the king of kings a god who is infinitely holy and we, we we can enjoy intimacy but we we don't want to forget reverence um I, I was at a conference not too long ago and the opening prayer was being given for god's blessing upon the meeting and two people pretty prominent people uh, one a missionary, one a leader of a fairly well-known assembly organization, were talking, and not even quietly, through the whole prayer. And um, they weren't far from the doorway. They could have easily just gone out. But I just thought, brethren, we, we need to not lose a sense of reverence. Holy and reverend is his name. And when we come into the presence of God, we, we ought not to be flippant. 
He's not ashamed to call us brethren, but we better be careful of having a brotherly attitude towards the Lord. He still is our sovereign and our Lord. And so I think reverence is very important. And so Esther shows reverence as she goes in. She's also very shrewd. She begins by asking for her own life first and then for that of her people. She's not being self-centered, but she's being shrewd. She's being wise. The king, her husband, would surely give earnest heed to a request which involved the life of his queen, the one that he has chosen carefully. If you remember, he's going to pay attention to this. Is somebody threatening the life of his queen? This is the first time the king knew that he was married to a Jewess. Up to now, she has not revealed her identity. And now she nails her colors to the mast. Now she's identifying with her people who are destined for genocide. The welfare of God's people was more important than her personal prestige. She's willing to come in and request for her people. And so what does she say? What's going on? She, she asks for a request uh, for let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be slain, to perish. But we, if we had been sold for bondmen and bondwoman, I, I could have held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the, the king's damage. So she says we're sold. I and my people. She courageously takes her place among the Jews, calling them my people. Do we see God's people as my people? Do we see that we're, we're, we're part of something bigger than just us? God's people are my people. Do we see it that way? And in the very words of the edict, she says, to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. All of the language that is in the actual edict itself, if you look back to chapter 3 and verse 13, uh, you will see that she uses the very language. And so it says in 3.13, the letters were sent by post unto all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, to cause, to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children, women in one day, even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, so on and so forth. So to be destroyed, to be slain, to perish, the very language of the edict. At the end of verse 4, there's a phrase that has really perplexed a lot of people. She says, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. And there's a lot of ink written about what does this actually mean. And I think the simplest explanation, and I often when I'm reading these things and reading all these arguments, I often find the simplest explanation is the one that satisfies me the most. Though Haman had been willing to pay a huge amount into the king's treasury, it can't make up for the loss that the king must incur. Now, not I don't believe a financial loss is in view here, but to, to the king's reputation. Because he would be complicit in a wholesale massacre of men, women, and children, what we would call genocide. And he would be, it would be carried out in his realm under his watch. And it would cause this man to be named among the, uh, the villains of, of history. History would not look well upon King Ahasuerus. Because it would, his name would be among the Hitlers, the Stalins, the Pol Pots of this world, individuals who have overseen a genocide on their watch. And she says, it, it'd be a different thing if we'd been sold into slavery, I, I would have held my peace. But something of the magnitude of the mass murder of the entire Jewish race I had to speak. And so she lays her case before the king and says, King, you couldn't, the damage would be far greater than any rewards you would ever get. 
So verse five and six, we think of the character of the enemy. What was he like, this man Haman? King Ahasuerus answered and said unto Esther the queen, Who is he? Where is he that durst presume in his heart to do so? And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. And Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. The king is understandably shocked. Just last night, the night before, if you like, he couldn't sleep. And he was reminded about an attempt on his own life. And now the queen is bringing to his attention, somebody is attempting to take her life. And you could imagine he's disturbed. Not only does somebody want to take him out, somebody wants to take her out. And he sat there in her presence, beholding her beauty. Her words probably moved him. And she's thinking to herself, what kind of monster would want to kill the queen? What monster would want to do this to this lovely, gracious woman? And so he asks, who is he? <laughs> and where is he that durst presume in his heart to do so? Who is he? Where is he? The king seems to be quite absent-minded at times. Has he forgotten the deal with Haman so quickly? Has he forgotten that uh, uh, that document that he just got him to to basically sign and gave him the ring to to hit it and uh, uh, with his with his wax seal? It's interesting how Esther answers with great deliberation and with coolness, calmly and cleverly. She brings her case to a climax at this emotional moment, and she says these words. She says, the, the enemy, <laughs> the, as to said, the adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. And then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. Interesting how she piles up descriptions. He's the adversary. Don't we know someone else who's the adversary? Uh, again, we said he, this man is very influenced, very satanic in his ways and his character. He's the adversary. He's the, the opponent, just as Satan is the adversary of God. He's the opponent of God. He's the enemy. Uh, the idea of an enemy has the idea of hate and hostility uh, charged in the words. Uh, he, he's, he's an opponent with hatred and hostility in his heart, and he's wicked, bad this man's a bad man in, in effect and in every way. He's malignant in his ways. And so once this is said, of course, it tells us that Haman was afraid. Afraid doesn't really do justice to it. It's a very strong word in Hebrew. Several translations render it, including the Derby translation, as terrified. And you can imagine he knows the power the king has, <laughs> and this is not looking good for him. And his response is that he is filled with terror. He's absolutely terrified. And John Wesley said this, and it was time for him to fear. When the queen was his prosecutor, the king was his judge, and his own conscience was a witness against him <laughs> yeah he, he's certainly in deep trouble isn't he queen is is his prosecutor the king is his judge his own conscience is a witness against him now we can better understand why god directed esther to delay her pleas and again it was a god thing he had directed her to do this because he wanted to give ahasuerus opportunity to learn what mordecai had done that Mordecai was a Jew, and that he deserved to be honored. If a Jew had saved the king's life, why would the king want to exterminate the Jews? Obviously, there's a loyalty factor here. So now the condemnation of, of Haman in verses 7 and 8. And so it says, And the king arising from the banquet of wine, in his wrath, went into the palace garden 
And Haman stood up to make request for his life to Esther the queen, for he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. My statement is, uh, or my guess is that, sorry, this statement perplexed the king. Who were her people? Initially, remember, he, he has no idea she's a Jewess. Wasn't she a Persian? Has she been keeping a secret from him? Is it possible, perhaps probable, there was a measure of shock too, both for the king and for Haman in learning that Esther was a Jewess? So the king needed to be solitary. He needed the quietness of the palace garden to think through and assess the situation, which is really actually quite out of character for King Ahasuerus. Usually, he would respond immediately and rashly. He's not known for deliberation. <laughs> and yet, in this instance, and maybe the shock of it all, he's so taken aback by the turn of events that he needed time to think. So he goes out into the garden. And his response, uh, of course, he's, he's quite clearly angry. The king, arising from the banquet of wine in his wrath, went to the palace garden. And so that would certainly have alerted Haman that things were not going to go quite so well for him. So he he's, he's certainly, uh, the, the king is not going to act rashly. He's going out the, to the garden. He's thinking through all of these, a lot of information is just conveyed to him. His wife wasn't who he thought she was. <laughs> She's from a different race. He didn't realize that. Uh, his choicest advisor is culpable of planning the the death of his wife. Uh, so all of these things, uh, just, uh, you know, it's a lot of information that has hit the king all at once, and he needs time to process all this. And so uh, he goes into the garden to think through these things. Now, either he ignored his complicity in the affair, or he felt that he'd been duped into agreeing to the Jews' destructions because he certainly didn't mention the Jews in chapter 3, but perhaps the king was unaware of the full contents of the decree he had signed. But no doubt his masculine pride was hurt, because he had misjudged, first of all, the character of Haman, right? He has elevated this man to the highest position below himself in the kingdom, and so that doesn't look good for his uh, his uh, uh, his discernment. He's put a man who wants to execute his wife, and and later he's going to find out execute the guy that he saved his life. Uh, so that would hurt his pride. He'd also made kind of made a fool of himself really by promoting this man and giving him so much influence. He'd also erred in approving a decree without first weighing all the facts. Let me read from Proverbs. Again, this great book of wisdom, Proverbs 18 and verse 13. And it, it, it warns us against making hasty decisions without first knowing all the information. Proverbs 18, 13, he that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is a folly and a shame unto him. And of course, when Haman presented this idea, you're going to get all this money in your coffers. Uh, these people are a, a kind of difficult people. They don't blend in very well. Uh, the king just signed it. He didn't really deliberate and think through it like he ought to have done. And we need to weigh the facts before. Sometimes we jump to judgments way too quickly. And it's good sometimes to weigh things. As a result, he had endangered the lives of two very special Jews, Mordecai, who had saved his life, and Esther, his beloved wife. So as the king left the house, Haman stands up. He knew the king well, and he could interpret the sovereign's moods. He knew there was a royal anger seething now, and it would be rightly directed towards him. No doubt, the king walked to and fro in the garden, doing the best he could to control his anger that welled up within him. And again, the book of Proverbs. Let me just read a couple of scriptures from Proverbs that would be relevant in this context. Proverbs 16, 14 says this, The wrath of a king 
is a messenger of death. The wrath of the king is a messenger of death. This doesn't look good for Haman. Also, Proverbs 19, verse 12, the king's wrath is as a roaring of a lion. <laughs> it's something to be afraid of. Uh, if you hear a, a lion roar in your proximity, uh, you need to be aware you're in great danger. So Haman is terrified. The arrogant bully has, as usual, in the face of disaster, has become a whining coward. And so we're going to see one of the great paradoxes of the book of Esther here. Haman, his fury towards the Jews was because a Jewish man would not bow down before, before him. Right? This is the root cause of all this. His fury is because a Jewish man would not bow down before him. And now Haman is going to prostrate himself before a Jewish woman, <laughs> begging for his life. Now, isn't that an interesting paradox? I find that fascinating. And so we see that not only does he stand up, it says <clears throat> that, again, in verse 7, uh, Haman, towards the end here, stood up to make requests for his life to Esther the queen, for he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. Then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place of the banquet of wine, and Haman was fallen upon the bed wherein Esther was. Then said the king, will he force the queen also before me in the house? As the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. So let me just say this. Uh, Persians and later Greeks and Romans and Jews would recline on couches when they ate. Maybe you've seen uh, the pictures of a Roman and he's laying down on this couch and somebody's feeding him grapes, you know, kind of that idea. Uh, so that was, that was the way uh, it was done in those days. And so at that, just at the moment that Haman falls down on the couch begging for his life, Again, one of these many what we'd call happenstances, uh, and yet they're clearly providential timing of God. The very minute he's lying down on the couch, the king returns. <laughs> and he, he sees this picture. And what does he see? This man getting onto the bed with his wife. And so he naturally accuses Haman of attempting to assault the queen in the very quarters of the king. Haman's timing could not have been worse. Just as he falls on the couch to plead for his life, the king walks in. Now, the Jewish Targum is very interesting. It adds that the angel Gabriel pushed Haman as the king entered into the room. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just love the imagination of these Jewish writers. But again, they're embellishing the text. It doesn't say anything about it. this is the providence of God. It doesn't need an angel to force the events. These are real happenings done by real people, but behind the scenes. God in his sovereignty and his perfect timing is working all this out. So Haman had led a Jew the previous day in a triumphal procession through the streets of the city. And now he's pleading with the Jewess for his very life. The people that he hated, and again, where does this hatred come from? We can't divorce Haman's actions from Satan, right? This prideful individual who hates God and hates the people of God. And so there's a satanic element to this. But here's the supreme irony. He's now not only had to lead a Jew in procession through the streets, he's now pleading with a Jewess for his very life, falling at the queen's, king's, queen's feet. It was a foolish and thoughtless thing to do because the king saw what looked like an assault on the modesty and chastity of the queen. His reaction has been described by some as being excessive, unreasonable, 
But again, as we understand something of the strict rules and the etiquette of the harem and the court in the East, we realize that uh, this, this was the, the right response. Uh, also, considering the king has been drinking, it's a banquet of wine. He's already angry, and he comes in and sees this scene. He responds in the only appropriate way. One of the things that happened in Persia, too, was that once a criminal is seen and convicted, he was, it was considered that it was, he, it was unworthy of him any longer to look on the face of the king. And, and so once a malefactor was consigned to their doom in Persia, the first thing was they covered the face of the individual with a veil or a napkin. And again, in this case, we see what happens. Will he force the queen also before me in the house? And the word went out of the king's mouth, and they covered Haman's face. He's now no longer to look at the sovereign because of his crime. And so now we come to the council of Harbona. And we notice it says in verse 9, Harbona, one of the chamberlains, said before the king. Now, just so we know that this man has been mentioned as one of the seven chamberlains uh, that were advisors to the king and, and close servants. If you look back in chapter 1, verse 10, uh, we read this man's name. It says, on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded uh, Mahuman, Bistha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zether, and Carcass, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus, the king. So he is one of the seven that have uh, kind of uh, this uh, intimate responsibility of serving the king in his chambers, uh, working close to him, uh, like perhaps a bit like Nehemiah, cupbearer of the king, uh, all of this uh, close responsibility. And so Habon, one of the chamberlains, verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 9, it says, said before the king, behold also the gallows, 50 cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, who had spoken good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. And the king said, hang him thereon. Some have speculated that, because remember these gallows, 75 uh, feet high, uh, they're enormous. It's an enormous thing that from the, the balcony of the king's uh, apartments, you could see the gallows. It was there. Uh, Some have suggested that Harbona, as the king comes in and sees this sight, and he uh, uh, he looks out and sees the gallows, and he's reminded of this. And of course, it was knowledge, uh, common knowledge, that this was Haman's plan, because he reminds him too that the reason for the gallows was Haman had made them for Mordecai. It was obviously known in the court. So as a result of this, the king says, hang him thereon. Brief words, uncompro uncompromising words, hang him thereon. Notice too that he, the king also learns at that moment that not only did this man intend to kill Esther, but the man who he had just learned the night before had saved his life was also a target of Haman, this wicked Haman. So in verse 10, it says, they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. It must have been a spectacle as Haman was escorted to his own garden to be hanged in full view of the citizens of Shushan, who were all well acquainted with his plan to destroy the Jewish popul populace. Remember that they, they were disturbed greatly when uh, this decree was posted around. And so now they're, they're witnessing this, quite a spectacle. And it tells us, with the hanging of Haman, it says the king was pacified. It says, then was the king's wrath pacified. 
It's kind of an interesting idea. The king's wrath was pacified. Uh, the actual word that's used here uh, in terms of the word pacified, it, it's used um, in uh, Genesis 8 to describe the waters of the flood receding. Uh, so the idea is the king's wrath uh, was at a peak and it and just as the waters the flood subsided the king's wrath subsided the day before haman had led mordecai through the streets dressed in royal splendor now haman himself was led through the same streets with a covering over his head to face the gallows and the end of his journey Again, some scriptures that I think are, are very significant. Once again, we're visiting the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 11 and verse 8. Proverbs 11 verse 8 says this. The righteous is delivered from trouble, and it comes to the wicked instead. <laughs> That's a great reference, isn't it? Righteous are delivered from trouble, and it comes to the wicked instead. That certainly was the case with Haman. Even as I have seen, it's the book of Job, chapter 4, verse 8, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. Let me read that again. Even as I have seen, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. Job 4, verse 8, New Testament, what a man sows, that shall he also reap the principle of sowing and reaping. In fact, it's an unchanging principle of sowing and reaping, and it's illustrated throughout the Bible, and it applies to both believers and unbelievers. It's a universal principle. What we sow is what we reap. I just want to give you some familiar examples. You'd, be, you'd know them well. Jacob, if you remember, killed an animal and lied to his father, pretending to be Esau. Genesis 27, verses 1 through 29. Years later, Jacob's sons killed an animal and lied to him, pretending that Joseph was dead. <laughs> now, isn't that interesting? What goes around comes around. That Jacob is the deceiver, and then later on, Jacob is deceived by his own sons in the very same manner. Pharaoh gave orders to drown the Jewish baby boys in the book of Exodus chapter 1. And one day, his entire army was drowned in the Red Sea, Exodus 14 and 15. David secretly took his neighbor's wife and committed adultery. And David's own son, Absalom, took his father's concubines and openly committed adultery with them. Furthermore, David's daughter Tamar was raped by her half-brother Ammon. David killed Bathsheba's husband. And three of David's own sons were slain, Absalom, Amnon, and Adonijah. Saul of Tarsus encouraged the stoning of Stephen. And when he became Paul the missionary, he was stoned himself at Lystra. And so don't we see a pattern here of sowing and reaping, sowing and reaping? We need to be careful what we sow. Because we may get back the very thing that we sow. That might be a good thing if we're sowing to the spirit, <laughs> but if we're sowing to the flesh, of the flesh, we will reap corruption. Some great lessons in this chapter. Not only is there personal lessons, but there's also a lesson about the nation of Israel. One thing we learn, notice from history is that every enemy that has ever to tried to destroy Israel has ultimately been destroyed. God says, Genesis 12, verse 3, I'll bless them who bless thee, and I will curse him that curseth thee. And he's always kept up to his promise. God takes his promises seriously, even if the nations of the world ignore them or challenge them, whether it's Pharaoh in Egypt, Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, Haman in Persia, 
Hitler in Germany, the enemy of the Jews is the enemy of Almighty God, and he will not succeed. There's a saying, we were in Texas last weekend, and there's a saying, don't mess with Texas. <laughs> Let me say this, don't mess with the Jews. It's a very, very dangerous business to mess with the Jews. There are consequences. They're the apple of God's eye. Whoever touches them touches the apple of God's eye. Don't dare prod God in the eye. <laughs> there will be severe consequences. Now, I don't know how you feel about this chapter. I don't know if there's a sense in your own heart that as you heard this and you hear about what Haman gets in the end, there's a sense of relief. He got it. And there's that temptation in all of us, isn't there? But I want to read you a scripture from the book of Ezekiel that may indicate that sometimes our attitude is not the attitude of God. Ezekiel 33, 11, very interesting scripture. It says, say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? And so could we say that in a general sense, that it actually gives God no pleasure? So the death of Haman might bring pleasure to us, but I think what God is saying in Ezekiel is he would much rather have had Haman repent. Than die. You see, it's possible for us to have hearts a bit like James and John. Do you remember these sons of thunder? Remember what they said about the Samaritans? Lord, can we call fire down from heaven and zap these people? And what does the Lord say? You do not know what spirit you're of. And sometimes I think. For us, it's very easy for us to become like James and John, sons of thunder. And we want people to, to get it, you know. We want them to uh, have their comeuppance, if you like. To, to, uh, and really what we should be yearning for is their repentance. And their bringing being brought back to reconciliation with God. And so here's a, 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 the end of Haman. Lots of practical lessons in it all. Certainly, uh, we, we need to make sure that we're not like Haman. What were his sins? Well, he was a proud man. And God hates it. He said it's an abomination. And his pride and his self-seeking. And we see it, don't we? Paul writes uh, uh, to the Philippians about uh, the very same things that can affect the people of God as well. Don't let anything be done uh, by... Uh, selfish ambition, but in lowliness of mind, uh, and so strife and and selfish ambition, and so we uh, we need to learn these lessons. and And uh, it's so easy for us to become puffed up with pride, and it's we're never more unChristlike when we're prideful. We're we more resemble Satan than we resemble the Lord Jesus when pride is gripping our hearts. On the other hand, when we walk humbly with our God, we never more Christ-like, because here's the one that humbled himself, became obedient even to death. Yes, the death of the cross. May God help us to be more like the Savior. Amen.